Okay. Uh, I'm calling the Thursday, February 14th, special meeting of the Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Commission to order. And happy Valentine's Day, everybody. <laughs> so do you want to tell us about the agenda? Sure. I'll take roll call. Okay. Commissioner Scarpetian? Here. Khan is absent. Rob Fogel is absent. Sharkey? Here. President Patrick? Here. The agenda for the February 14, 2013 meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside City Hall on Friday, February 8, 2013. Item 2, upcoming council agenda items. Mr. Duran. Yes, President Patrick, members of the uh, commission. Coming up on February 20, 26th, we have a, a report for a motion to, to provide direction to staff regarding the 2014 Rose Float, including the budget for the float, uh, a fundraising strategy, the design theme, the design committee, and riderships. Um, also on Febu February 26th, we have a report regarding the motion to approve an operations plan and lease agreement with All for Health, Health for All Incorporated, which is a nonprofit organization in Glendale, to occupy the Cedar House at uh, Glendale Heritage Gardens Park in order for them to provide youth services out of that facility. Uh, a third item that we have is a motion to approve the implementation of a proposed indoor soccer program at the Civic Auditorium and a resolution of appropriation to pay for startup costs uh, subject to review and recommendation by the uh, commission, which you will do at today's meeting. Coming up on March uh, 5th, we have a motion to review and approve the pre-designation of park and library facilities that would per permit the serving of alcohol. Um, and again, as was reviewed and recommended by the uh, commission, uh, I think it was at the last meeting. And President uh, Patrick, those are the um, only agenda items we have on the docket as of now. Okay, thank you very much. What is next? Item three, commission staff comments. Are there any Not comments? Okay. Oh, I could just one more time <laughs> announce <Okay. laughs> our, <laughs> why not? Uh, Sunday, May 5th is our Verdugo Mountains 10K hike and trail run. So there's still time to prepare for that. And it'll be at our beautiful Brand Park. If you want more information, go to runtheverdugos.com. And our presenting sponsor, thanks to Glendale Memorial Hospital, and we have some more sponsors coming in, which I'll announce next time. Uh, that, that, again, is May 5th at Brand Park, and we expect about 700 participants. So it should be another successful day. Um, and that's it. OK. Um, let's see, before we move on, oh, I'm sorry. If I may, President Patrick, members of commission, thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, announce to the public and to commission that our 63rd annual Arbor Day, co-sponsored by our department and Glendale Beautiful, will be held March 5th at 10 a.m. at the uh, beautiful Casa Adobe de San Rafael. It typically is every first Tuesday of March. If people are watching, please note that. Every first Tuesday of March, we hold our Arbor Day event. Um, if you like to donate a tree in memory or honor of someone, please contact our office, the Parks Office, 548-2054. You can ask for me, Coco, personally. I'll be happy to get you the documentation to fill out the forms, or I could put you in touch with Glendale Beautiful. Uh, we are also geared to receive the uh, Tree City USA Award, and this year we're also receiving the Growth Award for all the work we've done in the fields, along with public works and all the tree work that they do in our field. Uh, once again, March 5th, Arbor Day at the Casa Adobe de San Rafael. Trees are $45. If you'd like to purchase a tree and uh, donate in someone's name, contact our office. Okay, thank, thank you. you. It's a very nice ceremony. I have been to it before and recommend that everyone take part in this. Commissioner Sharkey. I, my mic light isn't on, so is, is my mic on right now? It is on. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't show here. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we need to note that Commissioner Khan has arrived. All right. I'm here. Good. <laughs> and what is next? Next is item four, oral communications. I don't have any cards. 
Item 5, Consent Items at A, Approval of the Minutes of the Commission's Special Meeting held on January 23rd, 2013. Okay. We need to approve the minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Um, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Roll call, please. Commissioner Scarpetian? Yes. Khan? Yes. Staffson Sharkey? Yes. President Patrick? Yes. Item 6, Business Agenda, A, Action Items at 1. Review proposed indoor soccer program at the Civic Auditorium. A is a motion to provide feedback regarding a proposed indoor soccer program at the Civic Auditorium and recommend approval by the City Council. And at B, a resolution to establish new fees for the proposed indoor soccer program subject to City Council's final approval. Okay, Mr. Duran. Uh, President Patrick, I'm going to turn it over to Oneg Bulanukian, Community Services Manager. He'll provide the report. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, President Patrick, members of the Commission, um, in your packets you'll find uh, the written report for the proposed indoor soccer program. I've also um, uh, worked on a PowerPoint presentation for all our viewers and uh, uh, Commission members. Um, we're proposing the indoor soccer program at the Civic Auditorium. Um, as uh, you know, Civic Auditorium has been is an enterprise operation and has been operating at a loss for many years. Um, over the last five years, the operating loss at the Civic Auditorium has decreased by 35 percent from 433,000 to 282,000. Uh, for this fiscal year, 2012-2013, uh, uh, staff will project that uh, 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 the loss will be uh, reduced to 157,000 due to staffing reductions and some consolidations. Um, we're uh, also working on a revenue generation strategy um, by improving and expanding our marketing efforts, uh, including a new and improved web page to attract clients. Uh, we're working with our IS department and our media team to um, create a new web page, um, a little bit more user friendly, um, and we would like to market Civic Auditorium online. Uh, we're working um, Santa Monica Civic Auditorium we've been told is under renovation, so we're trying to contact their clients to see if uh, Glendale Civic Auditorium um, is a venue for them to, uh, for their uh, events. Uh, we're partnering, uh, we're looking at partnering with other banquet halls for cross referrals, bringing back former clients such as Art of Boxing promotions for additional boxing events. Uh, we contacted uh, the promoter back in September, uh, he has some contract obligations up until I believe January, February, and once when his contract obligations are met with um, other venues that he's been using, um, he, we're going to meet with him and his uh, team to uh, see if we can have a few more boxing events at uh, the Civic. And we're also working with our uh, CIP section uh, to complete cosmetic improvements to the front of the auditorium to make it more attractive and marketable. Uh, furthermore, uh, staff is also continuing to reevaluate the operations to uh, strategically decrease expenditures um, by consolidating work in house, such as having city staff or hourly city employees, um, you know, wax the floors instead of uh, paying an outside contractor, uh, consolidating auditory and maintenance contracts with vendors used throughout the city for cost efficiency, and further reducing staff by altering the strategy of event staffing. Um, in a typical year, Civic Auditorium is rented 38 to 40 weekends a year. Uh, we have a variety of events, uh, wedding receptions, parties, and shows. Um, it sits idle Monday through Thursday. Um, concurrently, uh, recreation staff continues to observe and increase demand for soccer field use throughout the city, as we all are aware that we do need more soccer uh, fields uh, in the city of Glendale. And currently the city has only three outdoor soccer fields available for rent and no indoor facilities. Uh, the number of soccer groups in the community have requested um, to use Pacific Community Center and Maple Park Community Center for indoor soccer as an alternative uh, to outdoor play. And, you know, based on the availability of facilities, the size, logistically, um, it wasn't feasible to have indoor soccer at you know, Maple Park or Pacific Community Center. Um, ideal location for indoor soccer, uh, 
you know, we decided a civic auditorium uh, can be used Monday through Thursday and on some weekends, Saturdays, Sundays, Friday through Saturday, uh, based on availability. Um, in an effort to address the demand for soccer fields in Glendale, staff is uh, proposing the introduction of the indoor soccer program, which would utilize the upper level auditorium, the 10,800 square foot upper level at the Civic Auditorium. Um, we're proposing to use 6,000 square feet of the 10,800 square foot available for six on seven or seven on seven indoor soccer. Ideally for indoor soccer, six on six or seven on seven uh, is ideal for uh, indoor soccer program. Um, we're working with a vendor for, uh, uh, to purchase a containment system. Um, will be purchased um, to define the playing area and prevent the ball from going beyond the field of play. The containment system will also help minimize damage, wear and tear to the rest of the auditorium that can be uh, directly attributed to the soccer usage. Um, the portable, the containment system is portable. Um, there are three and a half feet in height, and then you have uh, also the netting. I'll show you some pictures on the next couple slides. And it takes about two hours for the staff to uh, assemble and disassemble the uh, units, so it's uh, not that labor intensive. It's like a puzzle. Um, the fiscal impact: um, we're hoping to generate uh, an estimated revenue of 110,000 a year. Operating expenses, which include staffing, uh, 30,000 a year, and a one-time expense of 25,000. Uh, the 25,000 will include uh, the portable uh, containment wall, the netting system, and the two uh, goals. Uh, that'll be one-time um, expense um, from our 101. I'm sorry, 501 Recreation Fund. And um, in subsequent years, we're estimating 110,000 in revenue with 30,000 expenditures per year for staffing, with a net profit of $80,000 per year. Uh, this slide shows uh, the netting um, and the pro wall system. Uh, the next slide is just the pro wall. Um, this is three and a half feet, just like a puzzle. You don't need any tools. Um, it's very easy to assemble and disassemble. And then this is a rendering of the Civic Auditorium with the portable system. We haven't purchased it yet. This is just, um, this is Photoshop. <laughs> we haven't purchased it yet. So this is what the Civic Auditorium will look like uh, with the portable wall. Um, we'll have one soccer goal here and, of course, a soccer goal here. We're going to go ahead and put, uh, you know, tape. Um, we're going to use basketball court tape, uh, which uh, won't damage the hardwood floor. And um, we can have six-on-six, seven-on-seven uh, soccer, soccer play. Um, proposed hours of operation Monday through Thursday, 5 p.m. to 11 p.m., um, during the summer break or when GUSD is on uh, holiday break, um, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., Monday through Thursday, we like to encourage uh, soccer academies or soccer groups to hold uh, some sort of camps, um, rent out the facility uh, for camp and uh, for soccer instruction and soccer play. Friday through Sunday, like I said, based on availability, um, our number one priority Friday through Sunday are larger <coughs> events such as our doll shows, our antique shows, weddings and private parties, dinner dances. So if there's uh, availability on a Friday through Sunday, we'll keep the uh, portable wall system up, the entire arena up for uh, Saturday uh, or weekend, uh, weekend use. But our, the main program, we would like to use the facility Monday through Thursday. Uh, the standard hourly rate we're proposing is $75 an hour, including staff. It'll include one employee to monitor play, monitor the restrooms, monitor the facility. Um, filming hourly rate, I included uh, the hourly rate of $112.50, which is 150% of the standard rate. I included the filming rate in hopes to attract um, filming companies and location managers to the Civic Auditorium. Uh, for possibly renting out 
the indoor soccer rink for any film that they would like to uh, use an indoor soccer uh, rink. Um, we're planning on having weekend tournaments. Um, if there's availability on a given weekend, we can have weekend tournaments and charge 375 per team. That's the standard rate for our uh, teams for, uh, for a weekend tournament. And uh, my hope is also to have birthday parties up to 50 people. Um, they can rent out the indoor soccer ring for $400, minimum of two and a half hours. Um, I believe this will be a very popular program, birthday parties. Uh, we can uh, market the rink at you know, AYSO or any of our private or uh, youth groups that use our outdoor facilities for soccer. What better way to use um, Civic Auditorium for a birthday party? Um, any questions? I'm sure Mr. Garpedian has ah, yes. questions and comments. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. A uh, few, few quick questions. First of all, the size of the, the, the field, what is the, the average size of the field for, for six, 6 v 6 uh, soccer field? It's about 7,000 square feet. Uh, futsal, it's called futsal, it's uh, Brazilian soccer, indoor soccer. It's about 6,000 square feet. Uh, six to seven thousand. So uh, the regular play is about f uh, five on five. We can bump it up to six on six or seven on seven. And the, <clears throat> the turf is it going to be a turf or is it going to be just a hardwood floor? It's just going to be the current hardwood floor right now. Hardwood it's in floor. it's in good condition. Uh, we did conduct a benchmark survey of soccer uh, arenas statewide. It's uh, in your packet. Um, we've contacted uh, the organizations that use hardwood, and they said that it's. You can use hardwood. I mean, you, right. we need to uh, have our own policy, you know, no skid policy or no fall policy. All our uh, participants will sign the indemnity uh, forms that we have, uh, the liability forms and so on. But uh, it is hardwood. It is playable on hardwood. Okay. And, uh, yeah, because some of these older turfs uh, for indoor soccer are like sandpapers. God forbid you, you fall down or what have you, you get a big rash on them. Uh, the, the pricing... Uh, it's seventy-five dollars an hour, but for two and a half hours birthday parties, four hundred dollars. What is the the reason that if you rent it hourly, it's seventy-five, but for two and a half hours, you pay four hundred dollars? Well, four hundred dollars will also include the staffing, um, at least two staff, and also it's up to fifty people. Um, it's just when we conducted our benchmark, um, our benchmark uh, surveys, most of the uh, groups that we contacted charged an hourly rate of 100 or 125 just for organized play, and then for birthday parties, for four, um, you know, 395 to 400 dollars for two hours. We just went off the benchmark. Okay, because uh, the 75 dollars includes staffing as well. I mean, the hourly rate. One staffing, but this <clears throat> this 400 dollars will also, for example, if we have an event on a Friday night, we have a wedding. And we have a birthday party on a Saturday. Uh, it will also include the staff time to set up and tear down. So it includes the entire thing, right. the okay. entire staffing, not only per the event for two and a half hours. It's two hours for setup and two hours for breakdown. And uh, can the commission uh, make up a soccer team and play against the staff? I mean, sure. <laughs> <laughs> when, when do we, when do we start? I mean, <laughs> Our hope is to start June 1st uh, of this year. Right. Once when we uh, get approval from commission, and also we're going to go to council February 26th. Right. So once we get approval, uh, hopefully we can start in June 1st. Okay. Thank you very much. Commissioner Kahn. A couple questions for you as well. Um, just out of curiosity, on the exhibits that was shown, they had these acrylic panels yes. that were on top, and, and it says not we're not doing that. Why not? Uh, well... The acrylic panels were fifteen thousand um, dollars. It's just a uh, kind of a budget savings. Um, acrylics or the netting, it'll still do the job. I mean, um, there were fifteen thousand when we got the quote, whereas the netting is just forty three hundred. So, so there will be netting. Extended there will be netting. On top. Yes, seventy eight inches worth of netting. So, it, uh, the extent will be. A, there, was be, there will be about nine feet of coverage, eight and a half to nine feet of coverage, so um, to minimize damage to the civic walls. Okay. Yes. And 
to go back to this revenue, when you come up with $110,000 per year, is that conservative? Yes. That's conservative. Um, if we do it correctly, it'll be conservative. Okay. So yeah. we're, we're, we're thinking that first year coming out, we're making at least $110,000. That's our goal, yes, because we are going to be marketing to all our soccer users at the sports complex at Pacific, and we're going to uh, go to the John Farrar soccer fields, the soccer fields up in San Fernando, and we're going to start marketing the indoor soccer program. And the Tri-City area will be the in only indoor soccer uh, arena. So the closest one will be Stoner Recreation Center, and then we have one in Northridge, Northridge Futsal. Uh, there's one in West Covina, Folsom, which is up north, but uh, we don't have any in the south, uh, in the tri-region area. So my hope is that starting in June, Monday through Thursday, between 5 p.m. to 11 p.m., we're, we're fully booked. So you won't have a problem feeling that they're in out. It's, it's not going to be a problem. No. Then to go back to, would it make sense to get the, if we're really going to have this as <coughs> something that's long-term viable, that's making significant money, does it make sense to get the permanent, the plexiglass things rather than just the netting? I mean, we could look into that option. Uh, my concern is also storage. Netting, you can just fold, put it in a box. Uh, storage will be a little challenging um, at the Civic. Okay. And in case if we want to move the indoor soccer program to any of our, um, any of the other facilities or if we have newer facilities, um, that might be an option. Uh, I guess we can see how it goes uh, we for can, the first year. And I'd like to try it out first, and <laughs> hopefully. But my goal is uh, that we will bring in the revenue. Okay. Thank you. Mi Commissioner Khan, if, if I may add, uh, aesthetically, the plexiglass uh, does, look, does look better. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're a spectator, it's easier to look through the glass than it would be the net. So we'll, c we'll continue to uh, look at that further, but as, as of now, we'll, we'll, we'll plan on the netting. Yes, I think it's a great soccer. idea for so many reasons. The revenue, it's a sport that's so popular right now. Uh, and it also, we've been asked about park space for soccer fields, and here we are with space. The only question I have, and I apologize if I missed it, sure. um, what about utilities, um, keeping it cool in the summer and warm in the winter? Is that a huge cost? I have no idea. Um. I don't think it'll be a huge cost, uh, but we, uh, I can ask you in a year. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much utilities uh, we'll be using, but uh, um, it'll offset, I mean, the revenue that we'll bring in will offset the, our utilities cost. It's a pretty thick building, so yes. I can imagine that it would be uh, comfortable in there. Yeah. Wondering. Yeah, I think it's a win, win, win. <laughs> I would agree. I, I think as many times as we've been asked about soccer fields, I don't know much about soccer, but and I know that outdoor soccer and indoor soccer are different, but it seems to me like this will go a long ways towards solving the need for the soccer fields and also solving the, solving the need for revenue on, on the park side. So it does seem like a win-win situation. Um, I, I do have one question from a little different angle. I'm worrying about the hardwood floor. Uh, I know in the report that, that you said that this would not hurt the hardwood floor, um, but then you're going to put tape on here to mark the field. What happens if I want to book my wedding there on Friday night and I probably don't want tape all over the hard, hardwood floor? How does all that impact the hardwood floor? We'll just take the tape off and it comes off with goo gun. The stickiness comes off the adhesive will come off with goo gun. Okay. We do it at uh, Pacific and at Maple Park. Okay. It's, uh, even though Pacific and Maple Park are TerraFlex floors, uh, we'll just pull it off and you know have staff wipe it down. It'll take less than 20 minutes. And is soccer damaging to a hard hardwood floor? Not at all. Because they're not going to be using cleats. They'll use futsal shoes or they'll use regular tennis shoes. Okay. Um, so there won't be any damage to the floors. Okay. So this won't interfere with the other kinds of activities no, that we not have at all. there? Okay. Did a great presentation. Very thorough. Thank you. And then, like, I want to, uh, I want to add, like I mentioned before, that um, the program will be Monday through Friday, or for, I'm sorry, Monday through Thursday, and then Friday through uh, Sunday 
our main priority will be bringing in the larger events. And those 10 to 12 weekends at the facility we know are going to be available, that's when we'll rent it out to birthday parties and uh, have our weekend tournaments and so on. So, so is there some limit on how much in advance y you can book soccer or a birthday party on the weekend so that you have time to do those larger events? M most of our larger events are booked, you know, six to nine months in advance. So we're pretty aware which uh, weekends will be available for soccer. Thank you. Okay, very good report. So we have both a resolution and a motion here. Is there any feedback that we want <coughs> to supply? Are we happy with the report and the resolution as they stand? So we need. I'm, I'm. I have no problems with this. I can't find. Okay. Uh, anything. No, the only I thing I'd, I'd add is looking into the plexiglass or the clear glass as an alternative, and just looking into it, if it would make sense. Because I do think it. If you're sitting there watching the event, you're able to see clearer through if it's your child or if it's your friend or whomever. It's a. It's a. It's a more pleasant viewing experience. So just to consider. I, but it I looked agree. a little tiny in that picture, too. The, I mean, the room is huge. So it looked like there was a lot of white there. Is that what you're talking about? The, no, I'm, I'm oh. talking about the, uh, what, what you saw, you did not see the netting on top. Oh, I see. So okay. you're not going to have a clear view oh, through okay. to the field to watch the people play. There's netting. Mm -hmm. And so if you had a clear glass, it's kind of like if you were watching it's something. like watching hockey. It. It's like watching hockey. hockey. Exactly. Yeah. That's just it's the what, same right. concept. That was right. the visual I just had. Right. was hockey. Okay. And I can see where the plexiglass would be a much more pleasant viewing experience, but I also know what storage situations are like in city facilities. So I think you're going to have to kind of balance all that. Okay. And it may be to do the first year with the netting and then the second year. Just to look into, into it. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I would agree if you've got room to store it. It right. does have a clean look. Yeah, yeah. It's very clean. Okay, so first of all, we need, I'm looking at Iris. First on the agenda, we have the, the motion. Okay, I could look at my agenda. All right, so we have a motion to provide feedback regarding the proposed indoor soccer program. Um, and the only feedback that we're offering at this point is to please look into the plexiglass uh, top part of, of the field. So is there someone that would like to make this motion? I'll make that motion. Okay. Is there somebody that would like to second it? I'll second it. All righty. <laughs> May we have roll call? Sure. Uh, Commissioner Skarpetian? Yes. Khan? Yes. Rob Fogel Zetson? Sharkey? Yes. President Patrick? Yes. Okay, so now we have the resolution to establish new field fees for the proposed indoor soccer program, <coughs> and you have the resolution in your packet. So uh, is there someone that would like to move the resolution? I'll move the resolution. Okay, second? Second. Take roll call. Commissioner Skarpetian? Yes. Khan? Yes. Rob Fogelsafson? Sharkey? Yes. President Patrick? Yes. Next, we have 6B, Reports for Information Only, 1, Mobile Recreation Program Annual Report. Hi. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, President Patrick, members of the Commission and Department staff. My name is Norma Baez, Community Services Coordinator at Pacific Community Center. I'm here to present the 2012 Mobile Recreation Program's Annual Report. At the end of 2011, the Mobile Recreation Program expanded past the Park and Play Program to include the Glendale Rocks Mobile Climbing Wall and the Party on the Go Rental Package. The Park and Play Program began in 2001. Park and Play is an 18-foot U-Haul style truck equipped with recreation supplies and sports equipment. 
Two recreation leaders visited many parks and neighborhoods to provide fun and safe activities for children of all ages. The program operated Monday through Friday from 2.45 to 4.45. The activities that were included every day were crafts, sports, trivia contests, homework help, and relays. The average monthly attendance in 2012 for park locations was 225 children. The program also visited 12 GUSD sites with an average of 84 students twice a month. The program also operated at three special events with an average attendance of 100 children. Five summer camp locations were also visited in June and July. The Park and Play 2012 program operated from January 1st to August 7th. The program was canceled for the 2012-13 fiscal year due to lack of funding. The Party on the Go rental package was created in 2011 due to interest from parents requesting to hire the Park and Play staff for birthday parties and special events. It is a rental package where two recreation leaders are hired to provide games and crafts for birthday parties or special occasions. The standard package includes up to six games or crafts for up to 12 children for two hours. Additional fees for additional children, staff, and hours may apply. In 2012, we only had one rental, so we took the time to get the word out about the new program. In 2012, the Party on the Go package was rented nine times with over 35 inquiries requesting rental information. There were a total of nine Party on the Go rentals. Six rentals were booked for private events, primarily birthday parties at Pacific Park, Fremont Park, and Verdugo Park. Of the nine rentals, one of the one was for the opening ceremonies for the Foothill Little League, one city event, and one event for the Senator Lou's office. The Party on the Go package has received increased attention. Um, this year, we also um, were able to provide the Party on the Go brochure, which we've been able to pass out at all the different events and also at the rentals to give to other parents, encouraging them to uh, book us for future events. The Glendale Rocks uh, Climbing Wall Program is a 26-foot mobile climbing wall. The standard rental package includes two trained uniform operators, the wall safety equipment for two hours, and additional hours can also be purchased. In 2010, the Parks Commission approved fees to allow rental of the climbing wall. The fees cover the costs for staff operations and maintenance of the wall, trailer, and safety equipment. The Glendale Rocks Climbing Wall has maintained its rental rate consistent with 2011 rentals. The Glendale Rocks Climbing Wall was also rented by the following clients. Glendale Unified School District, Glendale Healthy Kids, City Manager's Office, Glendale Police Department, local churches, Glendale Fire Department, YMCA, neighborhood associations, and PTAs. The mobile recreation program for 2012 participated in the following events throughout the city. Cruise night, annual block parties, canine in the park, Unity Fest, Glendale Unified School District special events, national night out, fire service day, Easter event at a local church, bring your child to work day, PTA fundraisers, and the Cesar Chavez commemorative event. Both the Party on the Go and Glendale Rocks rental packages are available to public and private organizations within the city limits for special events. We would like to make some recommendations for consideration. Um, we would like to offer some incentives for hiring us or booking us, like giving away some T-shirts or possibly water bottles with a department name, encouraging uh, other folks to get that free treat or prize when they um, book our events or book for their events. Uh, we also want to um, possibly look into looking at Groupon or Living Social deals to add uh, maybe a free <coughs> hour for booking us. Um, add the skate park to the mobile recreation program uh, for additional rental um, at different locations without Glendale, the mobile skate park unit, sorry. <laughs> um, also expand, expand um, to possibly going outside of the city limits for big events. We have had some requests from Santa Clarita, Pasadena, and Burbank to attend some of their big events, uh, but due to the nature of what we originally came up with, we decided to stay within, within Glendale city limits. Um, also, one thing that we created that I would like for you to review if, at your leisure is uh, we worked on a coloring book. 
which has all of the um, programs that are geared towards youth, and within it has all of our contact information um, on how to contact the swimming pool, the day camp program, how to use our drop-in gymnasiums for um, our, our, our gymnasiums for drop-in play, our fields. Um, and I'd like to use this as an opportunity to get the kids to color it, but also for the parents to use it like a, like a business card. And uh, the kids walk away with something. So this is just in draft form for your review. Uh, we made only a few copies, but once it's approved, uh, we would like to move forward with getting a few a few hundred copies distributed and um, among at our special events and at um, maybe some of our local schools as well. And if you, um, so that's that there, let's see, okay. Um, if you're planning your next event uh, for 2013, please consider our programs. You can contact me at 818-548-3220 or email me at nvias at ci.glendale.ca.us. You can also follow our department at uh, Facebook, which is Glendale CA Community Services and Parks, or follow us on Twitter at COG Parks. Do you have any questions? Any questions? That's a great idea. Yeah. <coughs> great idea. Can we have a party? Uh, <laughs> yes, please. <Yeah. laughs> um, and all the information is here. And, fun. and you do a beautiful job on Facebook, too. Thank you. I mean, just up to the minute. <laughs> up to the minute and creative. Thank you. Well, thank you for doing that. I have, I have a for question. Now. If uh, for birthday parties, if somebody wants to rent a, uh, our our services, what what do we offer again? One more time. What 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 do we offer? It's the climbing wall. It's the the, the climbing wall. Glendale Rocks climbing wall. It's um, the portable wall. We'll take it right. to your event um, or location, depending on if if. The location accommodates the wall. It's right. very specific where we can uh, set up the wall. But uh, for the party on the go package, that can be anywhere. We've done private residences, parks, community centers, churches, uh, different locations within the city. And that's uh, the opportunity for the parent to take a break from providing the games and uh, activities. And our staff run all of the activities and games and crafts during that time frame. We bring music. We have a fun atmosphere for the kids. Two hours for... For three hundred dollars. Three hundred dollars, and it's hundred dollars an hour after that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I like this coloring book. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> Put the phone numbers in it and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So hopefully you'll make them. Yeah, I think the kids will really like this, and lots yeah. of information for the parents. So that's a great idea. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And what is next? Okay, next we have item 6B2, Sports Complex Annual Report. Good afternoon, President Patrick and members of the Commission. I'm Gabrielle Golia, the Community Services Supervisor at the Glendale Sports Complex. Um, I'm here today to present our annual report on the Sports Complex operations. Um, the Sports Complex is nestled in the San Rafael Hills. Um, this is a really wonderful aerial shot that someone um, who visits our park on a daily basis took for us. Um, you can see our artificial turf soccer fields as well as uh, the two softball fields and the third one is kind of peeking out from in there. Um, and actually this photo would be taken from a location that will be on the new upcoming trails, the Catalina Verdugo Trail. Um, so something to look forward to as you're hiking our new trails when they're finished in the future. Facility amenities at the sports complex include three softball fields. One of those can also be used as a baseball field with a portable mount. We have our two artificial turf soccer fields. We have a community room for youth group meetings. Um, the little leagues use it primarily. And we also have an outdoor patio snack bar area. The snack bar is open in the evenings during our, uh, the, mostly during our softball leagues. Um, we find that the soccer players don't come all the way over to the snack bar usually, but uh, we have great success from the softball leagues. Uh, these are a few pictures of our softball fields. Um, the softball fields are primarily used for our adult softball leagues in the evenings. We also have rentals from travel ball youth teams. Uh, Flint Ridge Prep uses our one baseball field as their home field. The Glendale uh, Community College girls softball team uses one of the softball fields as their home field. And um, we have multiple just private youth rentals throughout the weekends. We also have an adult women's league that uses it on um, Saturday and Sunday mornings. 
This is a shot of our soccer fields, our artificial turf soccer fields. Um, you're looking at field number four with field number five in the distance. Um, the primary users on this field, um, mostly AYSO, the youth soccer organization, is on these, uses both of these fields. We also have private leagues, private youth leagues. Um, Flint Ridge Prep also uses this as their home field for the soccer uh, teams. We have our adult soccer leagues, and we have classes and camps and our master's soccer program. As I mentioned, um, we're in the construction phase of the Mountain Dew Trail and the Catalina Verdugo Trail. Um, these are two trails that are going to wind their way around the sports complex, both uh, right along the fire road behind the soccer fields and then also meandering up. Oops. Construction began on December 3rd on these trails. The anticipated completion is uh, April of this year. We had a little bit of a holdup due to a lot of rain um, in January, but uh, they are out there working every day. Uh, the Mountain Dew Trail will be an accessible, an ADA accessible trail. This one will run behind the soccer fields. <clears throat> It'll have some cutout areas for working out, sitting, resting, and uh, just uh, very accessible to everybody. The Catalina Verdugo Trail will meander up from the Mountain Dew Trail, wind all the way around, it'll have a connection up to the top, and then come out at the front of the complex. Um, staff at the sports complex, we do the reservations for the five athletic fields at the Glendale Sports Complex, also the community meeting room, and we also do all of the reservations for the 12 outlying fields in Glendale. So all of the little league fields and softball fields at Glendale. <clears throat> For the reservations and programs, we have one full-time community services specialist. This was in 2011-12. Um, currently, we've actually added some more full-time staffing to this budget. Um, but in this reporting period, we only had one full-time staff person and 15, 15 part-time staff. The other full-time staff were paid out of other accounts. Now they're paid out of this account as well. And in maintenance, during this reporting period, we had one supervisor, two gardeners, a laborer, and then a part-time laborer. The field revenue, uh, rental revenue in 2011-12 was $394,720. Um, this was a very slight decrease from the previous year. We feel that we actually booked more prime time hours. So the staff feel that this came from um, an increased use by the youth groups. They get a discounted rate. So the more time they use at the discounted rate, the less time we're renting out at the full rate. Uh, again, 85% of our prime hours were booked. That's 4 p.m. to 10 p.m., Monday through Friday, and all day Saturday and Sunday. And of the 365 days, the soccer fields were rented 361 days. So just the major holidays. We offer an adult slow pitch softball league. We have men's and co-ed. We had 553 teams registered in this reporting period, which is up from 509 the previous year. Very popular program, and we generated 159,545 in net revenue. The Adult Men's Soccer League is, um, we had brought to you a while back that we were proposing some different ideas and we've decided to hold on to the league. So we are operating it still. Um, it's offered Thursday and Saturdays. We offer 20 spaces, 10 per evening or 10 per day. And we are always 100% full. Um, net revenue in this reporting period was 18,400. We have um, a couple of programs that are city run also at the facility. We have the Master Soccer, uh, 2,283 participants. That is a duplicated number. People are coming every day, but we had that many people sign in in this reporting period. They pay $2 to play. Wednesdays and Fridays are for seniors or for or adults over 40, and then Tuesday and Thursday are for seniors over 60. And we have participants well into their 80s playing soccer, and they're very good. <laughs> they're very, very good. Um, Wednesday and Friday are from 7.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. And on Tuesday and Thursday, it's from 10.30 to 12 in the morning. We also offer contract classes. We have a Kids Love Soccer program. It's an educational soccer program for very small children, mommy and me up to six years old. 
And um, during this reporting period, we also had a running class. Uh, we're not offering it right now because um, <clears throat> we don't have an instructor, but we would love to bring it back. These are our revenue sources. We have field rentals, sports leagues, proprietary grants, rental income, contract classes, and tournaments. We brought in a total of just shy of 900,000 last year uh, with expenditures of 677,751 for net revenue at the uh, complex of 221,172. May I answer any questions about the sports complex? Commissioner Kahn. Uh, two questions. Sure. One is, when does the grant, the $175,000 grant, stop? Um, it's twofold. Um, I believe it runs through 2017, I think we have until to spend the money. Um, and it's also however much we pull annually until it's depleted. Um, so at the rate that we're pulling, we, we take 175000 a year. Um, we should be able to uh, push it out to 2017. Okay, and then for the net revenue, is, mm -hmm. that, is that to replace equipment? Is that to, what, what are we doing with that, the net revenue? Uh, that goes into the enterprise, uh, the revenue enterprise account. Um, so it would go for the whole department. Um, it might go to support programs that we're choosing to operate um, that aren't necessarily making a profit. And um, also we have uh, some plans for the profits in that for the future, I believe. Some of that is the indoor soccer, the purchase of the soccer equipment for the Civic Auditorium, so projects it, like that. It doesn't go to this complex, per se. It goes overall. Is that... Uh, Commissioner Kahn, President Patrick, it, the, the profits go into a, um, a fund balance. So it's, it's a fund balance for the whole department. We have approximately 20 enterprise fund accounts, uh, programs uh, which are based on fee-for-service and are designed to be self-supporting, and some are and some are not. For example, the profits that we, we make at the sports complex and with our facility rentals, which are our um, um, highest profit-making enterprise programs, would, would be used to leverage and offset the losses at the Civic Auditorium, so they're able to balance each other out. We're fortunate that right now we have a, a good fund balance of, of over $3 million. We are working on plans, plans now to begin to program and appropriate those funds to meet some of our needs. The two main enterprise operations are the Civic Auditorium, as Onig mentioned earlier, and, and the second one is the sports complex. So generally speaking, uh, that fund balance will be used to reinvest into those two um, f um, operations, the Civic Auditorium and the Sports Complex. We're working on a plan now to use the fund balance to um, replace the artificial turf soccer fields at the Sports Complex. We're, we're looking at, at potentially um, converting one of the baseball diamonds to um, artificial turf to, to make it dual purpose. We could use it for soccer as well as um, uh, baseball. Um, if we do need a new floor at the Civic Auditorium, which may cost up to or over $400,000, we would use this fund balance to, to, to fund the, the floor. So it, it goes into a general fund balance pot. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Sounds exciting out there. Thank Very you. busy. <laughs> Very busy, yes. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for your report. Thank you. And next. And 6B3 monthly activity reports. The first one at A is workforce development. Okay, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, uh, President Patrick and uh, commissioners. Uh, my name is Don Nakamoto. I'm the administrator over workforce development. Uh, one thing in your report I wanted to point out, we uh, held an event on Saturday uh, at Glendale Community College to uh, inform or actually to inspire youth in our community to take a look at the science, math, technology, and engineering areas for potential careers or academic pursuits. And we had uh, over 200 people, uh, kids, that attended from the middle school level uh, and high school level at uh, Burbank, Glendale, and Pasadena uh, school districts. So. Uh, turned out to be a pretty good event. Um, we had, uh, as a keynote speaker, 
uh, one of the key engineers on the Mars rover program from JPL. So she, I think, inspired a lot of kids. And uh, it's our hope that if we, uh, if that event uh, inspired even five to ten kids to really pursue that area, then uh, our mission was accomplished. So I wanted to mention that. Uh, and I also have a, <clears throat> a presentation. And uh, rather than giving my normal boring report, I thought I'd do something a little bit uh, more fun. This is um, just as some background. Our organization really has to take a look at what's happening in some of our local industries and new trends that are happening. Uh, entertainment is really a growing area uh, for the Glendale region and uh, it's probably going to be the top jobs producer uh, for the next 10 to 20 years. And so uh, there's something really important happening in that industry and I wanted to uh, point out some of these issues for you. It's kind of in a quiz format at the beginning so um, hopefully everybody is alert on this thing. So. Anyway, the question is, uh, what's right under our noses that has started to revolutionize the uh, entertainment industry? The first clue is that six years ago, a cell phone was a cell phone. Uh, today, it's a camera, radio, TV, credit card, bank teller, disease diagnostic tool. So it's really uh, taken a big step. Uh, before we get into the answers to that, uh, just some background on what's happening with the industry. There's been a pretty marked improvement in the employment in the industry. We're almost back to uh, pre or 2008 levels uh, prior to the recession. So that industry's recovered pretty well. Uh, the shooting has uh, picked up uh, in the LA area and uh, things appear to be going uh, pretty well. Next slide, please. Uh, the big area that's driving this uh, is that uh, filming for commercials is really doing well in Southern California, LA County in particular, um, because the uh, national economy is doing well and companies are looking to do more um, marketing of their products and services. And so LA represents about half of the US uh, market for filming uh, commercials. So it's a big industry and it's prominent in the Verdugo area as well. So back to uh, our little quiz, uh, next slide. 8% um, of all the uh, commercials shot were actually web-based commercials in LA. Next slide. So the answer, what's right under our noses, uh, the answer is mobile devices. Uh, they become a real vehicle for transmitting entertainment content. And um, somebody has to be developing that content and that content is most of it being created in the LA region. A lot of it probably in the Verdugo region. It's driving employment and that whole area is really exploding. It's compensating for some of the losses that we're seeing uh, in the television production industry locally. Um, 1,600 permits were uh, given for uh, web videos in LA and that's an increase of 46% from the previous year. Um, and it's accounting for a pretty good portion. It's still small, but a growing portion, about 10% of uh, TV location shooting in LA. Uh, some new vocabulary words, um, webisodes and mobisodes. Uh, the industry's capitalizing on the success of uh, certain television shows on cable and network and they're creating two minute and up to 10 minute little segments, new segments that can be accessed on a smartphone or tablet. And that's becoming a pretty strong area of growth for the, uh, the industry. However, it's hurting some traditional areas as well, the game development area, since a lot of people are accessing gaming now on mobile devices, uh, the traditional consoles are losing some audience, and so that's hurting employment in that area. This is a big area that's generating uh, money, uh, $5 billion in the U.S., uh, online entertainment uh, for 2012, it's expected to double by 2016. And it's not just an LA or US phenomenon. Um, worldwide, it's a $36 uh, billion dollar industry in 2011. 
and expected to increase by 80% uh, by 2016. Uh, one of the most prominent local companies, NBC's uh, Hulu uh, in Burbank, uh, they collected $700 million in revenues in 2012 by delivering online television content. Another big player in this is uh, YouTube. Um, they just opened a major production facility uh, in the Playa Vista area to access all the content that's being developed in the LA area. All the big local players, Disney, DreamWorks, Warner Brothers, are all trying to get in to figure out how they can uh, profit from this area. And Disney recently developed a venture capital fund in Burbank, $85 million fund to try and invest in some of the new technology in this area. Uh, the clearest impact of what's going on is uh, what's happening at the Glendale Creative Campus. The whole strategy behind that is to try and bring all the companies digital assets so they can collaborate and uh, use uh, this medium across different uh, areas like animation and digital and television, motion pictures. Um, some of the moves recently by Disney could actually hurt Burbank and North Hollywood, but benefit Glendale by moving these assets locally. Uh, LA City is really conscious of this whole phenomenon that's happening. They've actually dubbed it Silicon Beach because they've identified 500 new ventures in these areas stretching from Venice through downtown into Verdugo. And so uh, they're looking to really take advantage of what's happening now in the industry. A key driver of uh, everything that's happening is the education system. A lot of the new ideas and concepts and companies are coming out of uh, students from USC, UCLA, Caltech, along that uh, Silicon Beach corridor. Um, and there are actually more engineering students uh, from those three schools than um, Stanford and UC Berkeley that are actually assisting uh, most of the companies in the Silicon Valley. So the bottom line is there's a tremendous amount of talent locally that can really spur this industry and make it into something much bigger. Uh, here's a weird example. I'm always asked when I give this presentation, uh, okay, that's great that somebody can put things uh, on the Internet and be accessed by mobile um, devices, but how do you make money off of this? So here's kind of a weird example. I don't know if anybody has teenage kids, but uh, they would probably know about this. Uh, there's a thing called the Smosh Channel, and uh, it was created by two 18-year-old, pretty immature geeks that uh, started in their bedroom imitating television theme songs and uh, filming each other doing that. They put it on the internet, and it became a hit on the internet. Um, so they started creating their own kind of dumb weekly sketches, and pretty soon they were generating 3.5 million internet viewers, mostly teenagers. Today it's the number one rated YouTube channel, and they attract uh, 6.9 million uh, subscribers to their channel. So these two 18-year-olds are now 25. They have five channels. They've generated 157 million viewers and they're generating $10 million a year in revenue, ad revenue. Uh, they also receive a small free fee from YouTube. They were just bought by the, the uh, former president of Disney TV Animation, who's trying to turn that whole project into a big uh, internet media company. Um, they've spun off another channel, and that channel's generating 8,000 new subscribers a day. And they've turned down offers from traditional television networks to, uh, to go on to television because they believe there's a bigger opportunity on the internet. Um, the downside is shooting these uh, videos is a fairly cheap endeavor and the wage is not very high if you compare it to the traditional area where uh, one episode shoot could cost $2 million or $4 million or $5 million compared to doing uh, $20,000 on one of these. Uh, it shows you uh, the difference that's occurring uh, in this area. So one of the key things to consider is that a lot of this is happening in our region, right under our noses, 
and our organization is really looking at how we can have an impact. Uh, some of the questions we're really considering is how can we attract companies and projects to our region, how can we develop an environment where they can grow, and how can we connect unemployed people into these areas for potential job opportunities, and longer term, how do we uh, identify and create the skills needed for this industry as it grows bigger. Anyway, that's my presentation. Thanks. Do you have any questions? Very interesting. Yes. I've never heard of Smosh. <laughs> Me either. Yeah. Anybody else heard of that? No. Okay. Well, we're clearly the <laughs> wrong age group. The entertainment business is rubbing off on you. That was a very creative presentation. No, thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't think so. Thank you very much. Okay, so what is next? 6B3B Park Planning and Development. President Patrick, members of the Commission, um, you may recall that uh, we reported to you last time that we had a few items appearing before the um, City Council during this past few weeks. Um, um, just this last Tuesday on the 12th, the Council approved the rejection of the two bids, one for Maryland uh, Park and the other one was for Cali and Overdigo Adobe Construction. Uh, I, you may recall that both of those uh, bids came in higher than we had initially anticipated. Our strategy is to amend the scope of work and re-advertise for bids again. Um, I'm also happy to report to you that the Council the week before um, uh, approved the professional services agreement for uh, the Palmer Park project, and as we had suggested, or as we had um, um, informed you, we were recommending retention of uh, Susan Narduli Studio, the same design team that is working on the Maple mm -hmm. Park project. Um, speaking of Maple Park, we hope to fi uh, finalize the design and bring that to you within, actually during our next commission meeting in March, before we appear uh, before the council for their approval. And lastly, we also received approval to proceed with the roof replacement for the Civic Auditorium. That is a big ticket item project, uh, about $360,000. It's a very large roof for a very large facility. But uh, we're in the bidding phase right now, and we're hoping that we will be awarding the bid in mid-March um, and working with our friends at the Civic Auditorium to start the work without impacting our current rental opportunities. Um, unless you have any questions, that's my little report. Okay. Any questions? Sounds like you're keeping busy. We are. Thank you. Okay. And what is next? Next we have item 6B3C, Park Services. Once again, good afternoon, President Patrick, members of Commission. Uh, you have our report for the month of January in front of you. We completed 148 work orders that are for non-routine work. Uh, our gardening team completed 132 work orders. Pesticide applicator completed four work orders, and our irrigation repair crew, who's a crew of one at the moment, has completed 12 work orders. Uh, we've had a number of uh, water uh, meter issues, breaks, and so we've been pretty busy trying to patch everything up to get ready for the spring and summer months when we have serious uh, irrigation concerns at that time. Uh, we have once again highlighted some of the key items we'd like for you to pay attention to. I'm trying from month to month highlight different types of work because there are some consistent work that you may see like field uh, prep and or leveling some fields. And uh, in highlighting some of our presentation items today, I picked two uh, items that we haven't talked about so far. First one being, we'd like to talk about our Fremont Park. As you know, we've had some issues at Fremont Park, and we've been working closely with uh, the police department to try and clean up some of the area and reduce some of the trees that were blocking views to open it up, basically, the park and not allow any areas for kids to hide from police. This area that's highlighted in red is just adjacent to the 134 freeway. It is the very far south end of the facility. Uh, it actually is across the, the facility, and most people don't know that belongs to the park. It is a parking area. We've had some activity here, and 
uh, several months back, we did reduce some of the shrubbery, the trees that were in this corner. And if you know this area very well, you know there's actually a tunnel that goes under the freeway and links over to another side. It is an area of some safety concerns, so when we reduced the shrub beds, it cleared up and opened it up, and so there's much easier visibility for the public and, and the police that frequently visit the area, and it's a little safer. For this specific area, because the kids were congregating at night after hours, uh, police recommend that we put in some form of a locking mechanism to be able to close the parking lot and keep it closed in the evening hours as we do some of our facilities. Hence, we met with our facilities uh, staff with Public Works, and we have had these signs met for other facilities. We, we, what we did is a week ahead, we posted these signs to let the view of the public and the neighbors know if they were parking in the area that fairly soon we're going to be closing this parking lot. We put them in significant locations, two at the entrances and one in the dead center. So there are two entrances to this little small parking area and each one very visible for the public as they come in. Next phase was, oh, this is one from the right side, right entrance parking lot. Next was the installation of the, uh, the ballers. Now, um, Unfortunately, I don't have pictures of before for you to see, but these bollards, these three bollards, these yellow ones over here for the far right and entrance to the parking lot were installed by our uh, facilities services crews, as well as three on the opposing entrance, the uh, left entrance to the parking lot. And then what we did is, in, in, uh, to be able to lock it up, we had this chain installed with, uh, with the magnified little... Uh, I forget what they call them, to be able to let people know as they pull up with the lights, they can see that there is a chain and they won't run into the chain. And the idea is during the evening hours, this chain will be locked to the post on either end. And during the day hours, we actually would lock it over to the other side. That's, that's the reason why we put the third, uh, the ballard on the other side. And we're still working on a number of key safety concerns of Fremont. We'll bring that in the future. On the north side of the tennis courts, we police suggested for them to be, get a better visibility. There are a couple of trees that will have to be uh, reduced in size, and there may be one that we have to take out to make that very open and visible for PD as they pull in from the uh, east side, west side of the uh, facility. And this will be the uh, final product on that end. Next, seeing how we're getting into our summer, uh, spring months, uh, we have done a number of playground wood chip replacements and additions. Uh, this is one at Glorietta Park. As you can note, the circled area is the playground area at Glorietta. It, it is a very extensive process for us to put the fiber, which is engineered wood fiber, in the playground for the playground safety. We get a truck trailer load delivered to each facility by our vendor and as you can see they will uh, dump the load in their area we will have to have our tractors and our uh, little carts come in pick it up and distribute it in different areas of the play area and our staff will have to manually rake in the fall zones there are specific fall zones and play equipment that are part of the safety guidelines that must be at a certain height to provide the cushion to prevent any serious injuries from a fall for the children We've had this in a number of facilities. That was Glorietta Park. Similarly, Montrose Park, the play area is, once again, in the red circle. Same process. Uh, we wanted to highlight a few of these. This is a shot of them distributing it with a bunker rake, kind of pushing it out to areas they need. Montrose Park is a lot larger play area, so sometimes uh, the work tends to be greater for staff. A complete, uh, completed shot of Montrose Park. Similarly, we, we believe the playground area is in that little circle. It's, it's hard to see. Uh, but same idea. This is what, what it would look like before. Uh, you will note it is very low. We try to keep it consistently at significant levels, but you can imagine this is very costly. A one uh, tra tra trailer load that gets delivered to a facility cost of the materials alone is $2,500. And imagine the labor, intensive labor. You could have five guys working half day to actually get it layered across properly for the safety uh, concerns, the reasons that we need. And so, as, as you notice, similarly, we'll have the truck bring the load and, and dump it and allow for staff to distribute throughout the rest of the um, play areas. And lastly, this month, oh, you got a nice lot of pictures in Nibley for you. And lastly, Verdugo Park, south in the Verdugo Park. Similarly, we did the uh, same project and have it dumped and spread the mulch. Fiber, I should call it. For the next month, 
there are some facilities that is very difficult for these trucks to access. Uh, I can call up Harvard Mini as one because the play area is in a such location that this truck, the trailer, is not going to be able to pull up to. We do have the option, and we have had in the past done so, to have the vendor who delivers, they have a specialized mechanism where they actually can blow the fire bar in the specific areas that we need them. You can imagine that's very costly. We really cannot afford to do that at all sites. It could be $1,800 for that service alone. But sometimes we don't have a choice. So uh, this month we have it scheduled, and I hope we can get it done this month, of them having it blown in. For the future presentation, I'll show you the difference. And you know, once in a while, the cost being a factor, we'll have to go that route and uh, provide that service via a vendor. And that's about it. We are working with our uh, planning development folks for the future playgrounds to consider, rather than going with the engineer with fiber, to consider port in place rubberized uh, safety materials. Now, you can imagine the cost significantly higher to start off with. But we're looking at the annual savings of, let's say, 2500 per facility plus all the labor that we'd have to put in. Um, and comparing that with the initial cost versus on a daily basis, our staff would have to go and for security and safety reasons, they have to rake the fire bar in the proper fall zones to keep the proper safety. Now, if you fail to do that, there's going to be some liability. So for that reason, we're considering going forth. All new playground ins installations uh, would be recommended to have the uh, port in place uh, rubberized material. It is uh, approved for the use. It is ADA approved. And at the same time, it'll seriously significantly reduce our staff time on a daily basis on playgrounds, and we can start focusing their resources in other areas of that facility or other facilities. Um, that would conclude my presentation for today. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer for you. Yes. Excuse me. Sorry. When you mentioned a rubberized material, you're talking about the math or you're talking about the, the, the rubber chips? Uh, their options are plenty. You have the options of the rubberized chips that eventually get poured in, and they have a specialized glue that covers it. It isn't ideal for playgrounds because what kids are going to do, they're going to start ripping that off. We've considered the blocks that come in. They have a multitude of these things. They're little puzzle blocks. They actually mold together and then be the play area. Those also could tend to eventually rip apart. This is specialized pour that once you look at it, it eventually look like you know, carpeting. It is engineered, it's poured in the place, and then it has the coating on top that covers it all. It is a one-piece rubberized surfacing. Could vary in colors, designs, you know, it depends on how you want and how expensive you can afford it. Right. You can, any way you want, you can have it designed. Okay. Um, just so you also know, just for disclosure, those things eventually tend to rip and tear. I mean, we've had sometimes resident in their heels kind of walk out to reach out for their kids. It can put little divots and holes, but in kind of looking at the big picture, we figured efficiency-wise, it is more ideal for me to pay a couple of thousand dollars every three, four years to patch those little rip tear areas and rather than actually spending that amount annually to bring the fi bar. Um, at the same time, the life expectancy of the playgrounds you know, more standard-wise, 10 to 12 years to have it replaced. And so the expectancy of that rubberized material would also be anywhere from 7, 10 to 12 years. So timeline-wise, it may play out perfectly for us. And so we're going to give it a try. And with the Emil's staff and team going forward, I think we're, we're looking at some efficiency measures here. Great. Thanks. Sure. Thank you very much. Good. I like all the pictures helps to see what you're doing when you have, when you have some of the terminology we, I, I believe some of the terminology is difficult for people to picture what it means and hopefully we'll continue doing the, uh, the pictorial view of what we do for you doing a nice okay. job thank you Iris what is next 6B3D recreation and community services okay uh, President Patrick members of the Commission uh, in your package you'll find uh, the monthly activity report for recreation and community services section um, during the month of January at the Civic Auditorium, we had 11 events. Ten of them were revenue uh, generating and one was non-revenue generating. Uh, total revenue for January 2013 was $42,311.35. Um, $9,249 of it was from parking and $33,061 was from the actual event. Um, staff 
uh, delivered for a few events, uh, a food truck event that we had here at City Hall, and uh, two deliveries for uh, the winter shelter uh, program. Um, the winter shelter requested generators uh, for uh, for uh, heating uh, for heating the one of the facilities that they used uh, at the church. I believe it was the church, First Presbyterian First Presbyterian Church. Um, customer service and community centers monthly report uh, during again in January we had 217 revenue permits and 86 non-revenue permits that were processed uh, total revenue that our section brought in was thirty thousand eight hundred and four dollars and uh, below you'll see the breakdown of sites um, all the community centers and community buildings um, and their revenue that was brought in for in January that was short and sweet. <laughs> okay. Any questions, Any questions, comments? Okay. I think we are finished for today. The meeting is adjourned.